Running for Congress was never in the plan. It was never in the cards. It was never something that I thought I'd be able to do even uh, because our system, and I think most Americans know that our system is not designed for working class Americans to hold office. The average congressional race can run between $1.4 million to $13 million for one cycle, for one election. And so for a teacher or a nurse or a waitress to decide that she wants to run, he or she wants to run for office is such a high bar. How are you going to ask your friends and family for 400,000, a million dollars. Uh, so I never thought running for Congress was for me. I'm a first generation college student on my mom's side. And when the financial crisis hit, my family lost almost everything. Actually, my, my father had passed away in the middle of the financial crisis. And so I was suddenly in a home, my family was uh, my family was on the brink of foreclosure. My mom was a single mom. We were cleaning houses and driving buses just to keep a roof roof over our head. And it was during that time that I found myself interning and and working at organizations during the day and waitressing and bartending at night just to make sure that we made ends meet. And so I never thought that I would be able to run given the amount of money that's needed, the social connections and all of that. Um, but having that experience and working 18 hour days and little things like trying to afford health insurance when you're a waitress and, and that kind of economic stress and living through it and enduring past it uh, really showed me in a visceral way, what it's like to be an American in a way that I don't think most public officials understand. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the midst of all that, and Bernie Sanders started running, I decided to organize, start organizing the South Bronx. And then after, uh, after the general election, I decided that our country needed to come together in conversation. So. Me and a, a friend of two friends of mine, we jumped in an old Subaru and we started driving across the country. And we went to Ohio and we sat down with people there. We went to Flint, we went to Indiana, and we ended at Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. And having those conversations with people across the country, starting with the Bronx, going through Ohio, stopping in Flint, and, and meeting with Native peoples in Standing Rock, I really saw the breadth and depth of this country and the fact that a lot of our issues are really the same. And w there are a lot of things dividing us right now, but I do believe that the possibility to unite us exists. And we can be united in a way that is not superficial, that can make sure that working families have access to health care, that our future is and our planet is sustainable for our children. And so when, when I got back from Standing Rock, the day I got back from Standing Rock, I got a phone call from brand new Congress mm -hmm. asking if I'd be willing to run for office. And it was such a crazy um, option but when they said that you wouldn't have to worry about raising tons and tons of money mm -hmm. and we're running without any, without a dime of corporate PAC money, I said we should at least try because the 2018 midterm elections are going to be one of the most important turning points for our country and not just in terms of left and right and Republican and Democrat, but it, it could set a record in terms of candidates that are not taking corporate money to run for office and attain the levers of power. I am primarying a corporate Democrat. I am primarying a Democrat. I, my opponent's name is Joseph Crowley and he is the leader of the House Democratic Caucus. He takes about $3 million per cycle from Wall Street, pharmaceuticals, luxury real estate developers, private equity groups, and in fact, he actually takes money from the same people who finance the Trump presidency. So when we talk about left and right and partisan, it's really not so much or not as much about left versus right as it is top versus bottom. And economic inequality affects all of us. And in the Democratic Party, especially in my district, we, um, my community is the Bronx, 
Queens, and Rikers Island. Our district is 70% people of color, and we've never had a person of color represent us in American history. Our current incumbent was never even elected to the seat. Joe Crowley was appointed the seat by a family friend using New York City electoral loopholes, and he's been in Congress for 20 years ever since. And so we are giving, and we are providing the first primary election in New York 14 in almost a generation, in 14 years. Oh, wow. So we are the first person of color, I believe, to run for the seat um, in a district that, that is so predominantly and heavily immigrant, Hispanic, Latino, Bangladeshi, and so on. Um, and so I'm really proud to be in this race, and I'm also really proud to be giving people in the Bronx and Queens and Rikers an option where they don't feel like they have to sell out at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. um, we have a huge issue with cost of living in New York City. And what a lot of people don't know, and what a lot of our current debate distracts from right now, is cost of living and economics. The fact that it is so much harder to raise a family on one or two incomes now than it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the fact that there are a lot of politicians in both parties, and especially in New York City and the Democratic Party, that are financing and doing the work of luxury real estate developers. Foreclosures in Throgs Neck, in the Throgs Neck neighborhood of the Bronx, have gone up 145% in the last year. Those developers take take over those foreclosed properties, flip them, they'll develop them, they profit off of them, and then they take those profits and pump them into our electoral system. Mm -hmm. And um, we need, the only way that this is going to end and the only way that life is gonna get better for us as working class Americans is by electing people who don't take corporate PAC money. That is it. We have to keep an eye out for the underdogs in our congressional races in 2018. So I am a progressive Democrat running for Congress. So what does a progressive Democrat mean? That means that I believe that healthcare is right. I believe that every single working class American in this country, every man, woman, and child deserves to be protected from bankruptcy due to health issues. I don't think that anyone should go bankrupt because of a cancer diagnosis or multiple sclerosis or just the normal facts of aging. I believe that our climate is in a crisis right now and that for our economy and for our children, it is time to move over to a renewable energy economy by 2028. I believe as a, as a progressive Democrat that that is possible, it is attainable, and it will hire a ton of people and put a ton of people to work in the process. I believe that every single American should have the opportunity to attain the education that he or, or she sees fit for themselves. So I believe that every single American should have the opportunity to attend college or trade school. Our economy, and when we look at the history of our country, we extend our educational system about every 100 to 150 years. So when we first started, people would only have a fifth grade education when we first started this country, I mean, even less. Then we decided nationally that we needed to extend education and make middle school available to all Americans as part of our public schooling system. And then people don't even realize as late as, as 1950, 1940, that's when we really made high school available to all Americans. Now it's 2018, our economy has developed, technology is here, and we need to educate Americans and make public schooling extend to college and trade school. And so as a progressive Democrat, I believe in cradle to college and trade school. Mm -hmm. um, and I also believe that as a progressive Democrat, one of the biggest threats facing America is income inequality. And it is a situation and it is a, an issue that we need to address head on, and that starts with our electoral system. So how do you pay for all this? That's the classic question, right? <laughs> how do we pay for all this? It's, uh, we already do pay for it. It's, so here's what I, what I often tell people. Budgets are moral documents. Budgets are not always a question of how much do we have, which we do have enough, but it's it's about where are we spending the money that we already have. The GOP tax bill 
the amount of money that was given to corporations and the rich would have paid for Medicare for all and health care for every man, woman, and child in this country for the next five years. So it's there. We don't, and additionally, we added another, we added another several hundred billion dollars additionally to our military spending when the military didn't even ask for it. They didn't even want that additional spending, but we lopped it on there. And that could have financed public college tuition for, for years as well. So we actually have the money for these things. Additionally, we also need to return to the taxation levels that we had uh, in decades past. And so we're not even talking about anything new. We had, ha um, we had a point in our country, a point of actually very great social and economic mobility where taxation at the very, 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 very top levels uh, was a bit higher. And almost no one in our country felt the higher taxation rates for the, not even the 1%, but the top one of 1%. I think one myth that's really important to dispel here is that a lot of people think that doctors and lawyers are in the 1%, but they're not. Um, billionaires are. We're talking about people with hundreds of millions and billions of dollars um, having their taxation rates and paying a lower taxation rate than a waitress. And so we need to even that out. And the revenue that we bring in from that, which would be felt by very few Americans, would finance social systems and finance the expansion of opportunity for all. And this is not something that's new. It's not something that's radical. It's something that we used to do. And um, it, it, it is a, an interesting, it is kind of an, an interesting thing. Like when Donald Trump tapped into this idea of make America great again, there, there, were, there was times of economic opportunity. Wages rose until the 1970s. And I think it sounds like so, so controversial to say, but I think it is important that we do look back at times of great social and economic mobility. And of course, we have a lot of social progress to, be, to have made from them. But economically, when we look at a time of unions, when we look at a time of fair taxation rates, when people were, you know, when the very rich were paying their fair share, that was the time when we went to the moon. That was the time when Americans could afford a home. That was a time when people could afford to have a spouse raise their children and the other spouse um, help make ends meet. And all of those aspects, I think, are important to re-examine and, and look at when we ask this question, how do we pay for it? Because the resources are not as scarce as people like to make us believe.